There's a place where the cattle and the churches share the fields, a place where the roads are gravel and the springs run clear. Our journey today takes us to a quiet place nestled deep in the Ozark Mountains that once was the center of a small farming community. I'm Jim Vibrock. I've spent the last 30 years traveling around, photographing, documenting, and now videoing old water mills. These old mills were once the economic centers for the communities they served. We're going to take a step back in time and explore the mill, use water to grind corn, and discover the unique treasures inside the general store. It's an unbelievably beautiful summer's morning. I'm in Douglas County, Missouri, and this is Topaz Mill. Let's take a look around. My good friend and longtime caretaker, Joe Bob O'Neill, has agreed to show us around the 1895 mill. All this flour equipment in this mill came from Great Western Manufacturing in Leavenworth, Kansas. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> they were established in, 19, in 1858. And right here is a copy of the receipt dated May 2nd, 1903 from Great Western Manufacturing in Leavenworth. This is a receipt for when all this equipment was bought to go in here in 1903. That is so Three cool. pages, handwritten, for everything to make flour with. Now, it's not the stone to grind corn with. This is to make flour with. Is, is there a total cost in there? The cost is $1,650. Which was a lot. Seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a day. Yeah. But this company, Great Western, they were established in 1858. They're still in business today and they still make milling equipment. They are supposedly the longest continually running manufacturing company in the state of Kansas. Oh, they and I've been in touch with them. I've sent them copies, pictures of, of this and that, and they found some catalogs from 1900 and scanned pages out of it that this equipment would have been bought out of. They put their logo and wrote their name on everything. Like here's a real nice one right here. This is, this is their mm -hmm. Great Western Manufacturing. Yeah. Leavenworth, Kansas. That's been on there since 1903. He said that's either decal or printed right straight on the wood. They didn't have silk screen back then. Right. But the way these are, places they are, they almost got to be decal. Let's look at the equipment needed to process wheat into flour. When they brought the wheat in, they dumped the wheat in this bin in the floor. Okay. Okay, these are tapered bins. There's five of them in the basement. Four here and one there. I don't know what they all did. Mm -hmm. But uh, th when they got ready to make flour, they went, they turned the turbine on, and, and everything started running at once. All this equipment ran at the same time. You didn't start and stop any one piece of equipment. It all ran together. Mm -hmm. So these belts and cups started, started moving. They would pick the grain up out of the basement, take it clear to the third floor, cup at a time, and as it got to the top, it went over that pulley, and it threw that grain out of that cup. And your empty cup and belt went back down this chute right here. And it just continues a cup at a time. And when it threw it out of that cup, gravity fed it through shooting like all this shooting you see here. Gravity, there's five pieces of equipment on the second floor that go with these three roller mills. Now back up a little bit here. This mill made refined flour. It didn't make whole grain flour as far as I know because there's only one place in this mill to bag the flour. These are the three roller mills over here. But this first roller mill it has corrugated rolls. It's the one that cracks a grain of wheat apart. Okay? And you can see you can see the grooves in this um, I'm sure you've seen these uh -huh. other yep. times. This one's got this is a <clears throat> this is a corrugated roll. This cracks these are double rolls. There's a set of rolls here and a set of rolls back there. These two are smooth rolls. They that cracks the grain of wheat apart. The machinery on the second floor does the separating and sifting, and these is what smashes or mashes is the word that they use. They mash that endosperm into flour consistency. It's really not ground. You know, you always heard the term grind flour. Well, but these two roller mills are the same. And there's two roller there's two rolls in each one of these, so there's six six rolls here. These things have all kinds of adjustments, all kinds of little inspection doors there inspection door here so the miller can look at what's going on and there's adjustments he adjusts this this is an adjustment this is an adjustment 
So the miller would have to be pretty well know what he was doing to get the right product. I'm sure, I mean, sure, every, all wheat was probably a little bit different, you know, when somebody, but back then, there was only one type of wheat back in the late 1800s, so everybody's wheat was the same, but I'm sure there was different moisture content and stuff like that to it, you know, so. But uh, you can see, you can see right here, the Great Western Manufacturing, Leavenworth, Kansas. I asked the guy, I said, where did you buy the parts to make these machines with? And he said, we were originally a foundry and a machine shop. He said, what you see right there, every bit of that was made in our factory. He said, we poured the castings, we turned the pulleys, he said, we did everything at, at, the, at the Great Western. And they still make milling equipment today. When, when, they, when they brought this equipment down here, they would have sent a millerite with this equipment, Great Western would have, to install it in the building because the carpenter wouldn't have had a clue, you know. Right. And each one of these angles, all these different angles, and there's no two of them the same. Those are all cut to fit this building by the carpenter and the millerite. And every one of this was all cut by hand and screwed together. And look how tight every one of these seams are. Yeah. It's just like it was made in there. Yeah. And every one of them's like that. And this is all done by hand. There's no electricity. Let's head up to the second floor to look at the sifting equipment. Okay, this is this is the first step. When it comes up that first cup. This is a cleaner. This is a Eureka No Improved Dustless Milling Separator. It came from the S. Howe Company. You can't hardly read this, but it came from Silver Creek, New York. Great Western didn't make this, but they sold it to them because it's on that receipt down there. Mm -hmm. And okay, it went through the cleaner, then went back down to the basement, got picked up again, got taken up, then went through the smutter. Some wheat back in this day got a fungus inside the kernel and it's called smut wheat, it, and it would turn black. It's like mold, mm -hmm. and if you break that apart, they said it smelled real bad. They call it stinky smut is what it was called. Right. It still grows on your, on your stem of wheat, and it pretty much looks like wheat. It's not as healthy looking, but it gets harvested with everything else, and if you try to make that into flour, it contaminates your whole batch of flour. So physically, back then, you had to separate the smut wheat from the good wheat. They treat wheat seed so it won't get smut now, mm -hmm. is what they do. Mm -hmm. And no tell what else they do to it, but you right. know, but I did read that last night. They treat it to keep it out of there now. But this is some centrifugally that smut wheat is heavier. There was a guy from Illinois here one time getting a tour and he knew what corn smut was, and he said it's heavier because it's got moisture in it. Okay. So I guess the light stuff got spun to the outside and went into the flour with the good wheat bin and the and the smut came down here. It went in in the first floor in the corners of trash bin. The stuff that came out of the cleaner and the smutter went down into that, and it was probably just thrown in the river. Some mills didn't have bran dusters. If you had a bran duster in your operation, you get 10 to 15 percent more flour because there's that much of the endosperm that sticks to the bran, right. and it doesn't get separated and it gets thrown away. So, but uh, this is the bran duster. This is the first step that it goes through. This was run from this pulley right here. Okay, this line shaft all had pulleys coming off, belts coming off each one of these pulleys. But, uh, <clears throat> okay, when it went, after it went through that, then it started going through the bolter or the shaker. Some companies call this a sifter. Some call it a shaker. Bolt means sift is what that word means. <clears throat> there were, back in the late 1800s, there were hundreds and hundreds of companies that made milling equipment. All right. And milling was, people don't realize this, milling was one of the largest industries in the United States back in the late 1800s. There was mills everywhere. Yep. It's still huge today, but it's all conglomerated in you know big mills. If, if this is this is kind of strange. If you think about this, there's probably a half a million grocery stores in the United States, and each one of them has no tell how many bags of flour and how many loaves of bread sitting on there. So somebody's got to make a lot of flour all the time. Right. You know. I mean, I can't imagine. If you think about it that way, how do they make that much flour? Yeah. <laughs> But this, this, this is a, the rotary bolter. It sits there and sifts. It shakes. It said it has six chutes that come into the top of it from those belts and cups. It goes through there six different times, and there's 27 flexible chutes that come out of the bottom of it. The further it got through this, the cleaner it got. The more separated it got, and when when it finally went through the last roller mill, out of this thing through the last roller mill, 
it was flour consistency, but it still had stuff in it, like the germ was still in it and the bran, some, some pieces of the bran that didn't get separated in here. Well, then it went into this thing. This is called a flour dressing machine. That's what this company called it. Mm -hmm. Like I said, different companies call this stuff different things, and they were all different. I've got, I've got two other catalogs downstairs that are from different milling companies right. that they have roller mills in there. They look different than ours, but they all do the same, like a Ford and a Chevrolet. You right. know, they're different, but they all do the same. But this, this right here had a screen all the way around it, and this, this paddle in here is throwing that product up against that screen, and there's a brush all the way across the back that brushes that flour off that screen. The flour would get brushed off this and drop down into this bottom part, and these wooden tooth augers would take it to the last chute that's the one that the flower, the final flower, would have come out of here. And what didn't go through this screen went down these chutes into the shorts bin, okay. down in that corner. No, another little tidbit, that, that, uh, that receipt down there says that stuff was shipped from Leavenworth on a train to Mountain Grove. In 1903, it was taken off the train to Mountain Grove, put in a depot in Mountain Grove, and then brought the last 20 miles down here with either horse, ox, or mule, and wagon. Mm -hmm. And I have found out it was a two-day trip from here to Mountain Grove and back with a wagon. And you wonder, how many trips did it take them to get all this stuff up there? Topaz Mill is a spring-fed, water-powered mill. Joe Bob is down by the race, preparing the mill for operation. About this, you've got a lot of water here, and it's crystal clear. Where's it coming from? It's eight to ten million gallons a day. It comes out of the spring out there in that mill pond, and we'll walk out there, and you can see, you can see the spring where it comes out. We'll you'll see the pond out there, and uh, it, it was supposedly discovered by Henry Schoolcraft. You know who he is. You probably heard of him. He, he supposedly, when they came down, when they were making their journey in 1818, he supposedly, they were coming down the North Fork, found, discovered this spring, and he talks about it was mammoth-sized spring, came out of the ledge 200 feet wide or whatever, and flowed down about 400 yards and ran into the river and doubled the size of the river. So school, and he found a set of elk horns and hung it on a tree for future people that come through there could see that there'd been people here. Well, there's been Indians here for thousands of years, you know. Oh, right. they, they, when they bought this farm, they row crop, they plowed the fields and stuff, and they found arrowheads all the time everywhere, you know. We've got a nice collection of arrowheads over in the store building that come off this place, so. The original raceway that you see here now is, was wooden. Mm -hmm. And when, I, when they bought this farm in 56, that wooden raceway was rotted away. So in, in the early 90s, my uncle built this rock raceway to get the water down here. And he actually built a water wheel that sat right here on this frame. Okay. He said people would come, everybody associates a mill with a water wheel. Right. He said people would come and say, well, where's the wheel? And he said, well, this is a turbine powered mill. I'd have to explain that to him. So he built a 20-foot wheel that sat right there. I think that's pretty. And there are a few pictures that have been taken from down there of the back of this mill and that and that and they're beautiful. But uh, it came off in 2012 and destroyed itself. But uh, I, I, you know the plan was always to build it back, but I've never got around to it. Topaz Mill is powered by a turbine that is located at the bottom of what is called a pinstock. In this case, the pinstock is a recycled boiler tube. The operator opens a gate on the race filling the pinstock with water, creating what is called head pressure. The deeper the water in the pinstock, the more horsepower the turbine will produce. When the gates in the turbine are opened, the weight of the water will push through the impeller inside the turbine, creating a vortex that turns a shaft connected to the equipment inside of the mill using belts and pulleys.
one of the things I love about old mills is the structure themselves. These hand-hewn logs in these post and beam construction buildings are just fascinating for me. These are, uh, they look like sawn logs, but in the time period, they could very easily have been hand-hewn and you would have seen the as marks as you go up through there. What I like to point out is the joinery that is in these buildings. I mean, that is a probably a 10 inch square log, 10 inch square post right here. It's got the overlapping joint up there. And you can see where they've drilled the holes through there and had hand driven uh, pegs in there. And then behind me, you can see that the pegs are still sticking out back there. So uh, it just fascinates me that these buildings can be well over 100 years old, sometimes 200 years old, and they're put together with this time honored joinery system. And as a woodworker, I truly appreciate that. <music>
that's as fine as the core menu buying a store right there. Right. And it just goes through a door, a yeah. screen door screen. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> later, they had uh, what they called portable mills. The, the Meadows Mill Company uh, developed what they called portable yeah, ones. Yeah, I don't they, know what Meadows Mills like, are. And some of those were horizontal. Uh huh. And they were way easier to move than this would be. I mean, there's, there's thousands of pounds here. Right. And they would have had uh, the right, smaller those ones. were a little easy to use. Uh -huh. And they would have had a, a system very similar to this off okay. to the side. Oh, okay. That uh, as it moved, it it would it would vibrate. You know, it was hooked to the shoe up there. And it would shake and, and it, it, would, yeah, it would separate. And it would separate. It same right. same principle sense. as the homemade one you've got here. These millstones, they have to be sharpened, okay? This one has a millstone crane. Some of the smaller mills didn't have a millstone crane. I don't know if you've heard this one or not. Okay. This is an old wives' tale, but I've read it in two different places. They would still have to get this stone off of here. They would take a wooden wedge and drive in between there and get it up high enough that they could stick a pole through it. And two or three guys would pick that stone up, bring it over here. Sometimes it would get away from them. And it would either go through the floor or it would kill or maim somebody. Yeah, easily. And if a millstone got blood on it, they didn't use it anymore. If it killed a the guy, they used it for his tombstone. If it just maimed him, they put it in the walkway to the mill. So when you walked away from the mill, you took the evil spirits with you. And there's a millstone in the ground right at the corner of this mill. <laughs> I, I talk about this barber chair a lot. I think this is genius because the farmer really had nothing else to do while the product was being, you know, ground. Right. And so, you know, the whole family would have come. The kids well, would yeah, have sat right. and got their hair cut. The and you can only spend so much time in the store. Right. Mom would have been in the general store. So, mm -hmm. yeah, right. um, give them a fishing pole or give them a haircut. Or right, whatever. exactly. Yeah. And, and I like to tell the people, you know, when the farmer's leaving, he's if he's coming by himself to get some grain ground, He's driving away from his homestead out there, just getting ready to go over the hill, and the wife's on the porch saying, you sure shouldn't get a haircut while you're gone, you know? I mean, they, they truly made a day out of it. Exactly. You know, all the boys would have come, and they'd have put them one right after another. And, and you know this is a barber shop, obviously. Spent a whole dollar twenty-five. Right, for, for, all, for all five again. kids. Yeah. Or it cost them two dollars for all eight kids. Right. <laughs> It was not uncommon for entire communities to pop up around the mills. After all, they were the economic centers of the communities in which they served. So you would find post offices, general stores, churches, and all kinds of other small industries pop up around these mills. This is a general store. Let's take a look inside. Oh, look here. Look. look. Oh, I, don't I didn't remember it being this cool. What a cool place. It's the old stuff. A lot of old stuff. <laughs> so is this a collection of some kind, or was some of this left in here? Most of it was probably my grandparents, which they were born in 1900, and they used this stuff when they were alive. Right. And my dad and uncles were born in the teens and the 20s, so some of it would have been there. Some of it did get left in the store building. But and some of it's just been accumulated. People will bring us old stuff and different things and stuff, you know. So, but some stuff did get left in the store building. So, but the way now the way this store was, the way this counter and shelving is on this side, mm -hmm. this side was just like it. The okay. counter went all the way down here. The shelving was just like that side. And in the 70s, my uncle tore this counter out and put an axe handle factory in here and made axe handles in here on this side for about 10 or 12 years in the 70s and 80s. Ooh, okay. The post office sat right here on this end of the counter. The actual post office closed in 1943. Is this the axe handle lathe? That's one of the lathes for making handles, the duplicating lathe. Uh-huh. You put a pattern in one end mm -hmm. and it turns out a handle.
Boy, the American pickers would like to come in here, wouldn't they? No, they wouldn't because there's nothing for sale. There you go. <laughs> Mills like these represent our nation's heritage. They are treasures in their own right. Many memories are contained within their walls, and the ingenuity of the people who built and ran them forged an industrial and growing country. They are unique pieces of history, frozen in time. I hope you've enjoyed our time at Topaz Mill. I'm Jim Vibrock. Let's go find another mill to explore. <laughs>